to praise you more, to honor you more in every way. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. That's welcome to adoration, Sunday service. Amen. God bless you. Uh, I'm Mac. This is Myra, a.k.a. Sugar Cookie, a.k.a. Love of My Life, a.k.a. Just a Pretty Little Thing, and a.k.a. Girl, I like you. <laughs> you know what? If you can't have fun with this thing, then uh, you're in the wrong business, right? <laughs> Amen. So we just want to uh, give some waves out there. We see you, Dean Peters, and see you, Amy. Love you guys and whoever else that I don't see and uh, out there with us. We just greet you with the joy of Jesus Christ on this Sunday uh, afternoon for us, I guess it's uh, close to evening for them, uh, depending on where they are in the world. Uh, but we are just excited as always. Uh, I know that Myra's getting ready to share a moment that will blow our minds <laughs> in her <laughs> own <laughs> sweet, beautiful little way. And uh, I'm going to try to come behind that with something that's relevant. We hope that... Uh, in both cases that we're truly being on point with the Word of God. Um, for any of you that have never spent any time with us on these Sundays or on YouTube, where we have a plethora of videos all over the place, uh, you can go directly on YouTube to Adoration Talk Radio. We have so much content out there now, but you can check us out. Um, I see you, Francisco. God bless you. Actually, hola, hijo. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the main thing is that when we started out doing this, it was uh, during the, um, really the beginning stages of the pandemic when um, a lot of the churches had closed down and... Um, we just thought it was a travesty that the word of God was not getting out. Oh, praise God, Katira. My God, we're waving at you, darling. Love you. And I uh, got your message. We miss you, too. Um, you know, we, we recognize that the churches, for whatever reason, wouldn't be open. And we decided to dedicate our Sundays or any day of the week, really, in order to give you guys some content that we pray is relevant, that may not necessarily always sound like the other people that are out there, but the main thing, and I'm sure Sugar Cookie will agree with this, is that at the end of the day... Well, um, some things happened this week that drew me to Psalm 23. And what I love about um, the Lord is you go to the Word for certain things and he gives you something else and so I'm going to read it but I'm going to read it the way he wants me to present it so it's going to be a little bit different the Lord is our shepherd I sh we shall not want he maketh us to lie down in green pastures he leadeth us beside the still waters he restoreth our soul he leadeth us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with us. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Thou preparest a table before us in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest our head with oil. Our cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's the we. This is between my husband and I. Because we are together. So when I went for me, the Lord said, what about him? Whatever touches him touches you. 
Whatever touches me touches him. So this is a discussion we had this week. So I can't look at this psalm and not include him in it. But the psalm is something that we're very familiar with, with, but it does more than tell us that God protects, guides, and blesses. It shows us an image of a powerless sheep being cared for by an unfailing, careful shepherd. It's a close and intimate relationship. A king might do what's best for the majority. A shepherd knows each one of his sheep. We know the story in Luke 5, 15, 4, it says, he leaves the 99 and goes after that one. Mm. A king is not going to do that. A corporate leader is not going to do that. But our God does that every day when he thinks on us personally. When he sent his son Jesus for each one of us, that was a personal thing. He, it said he loved the world, but it's not like a collective corporate group. A corporate, a corporation is a, a, a group of people, but he looks at the world as individuals and each of us is different and he sees us that way. He knows how to touch your heart. He knows how to touch my heart. He knows how to touch Matt's heart because he knows what it is that would allow us to hear. Because one of the, one of the parts of this scripture that really touches me a lot Reminds me of a song. It says, prone to wander. It's part of the lyrics. And that's what a sheep does. Sheep, they say, we, we believe this. Sheep don't have a mind. They don't think. They just follow. So they're not really calculating their next move. So that's what we do. We're like sheep. We're prone to wander. And sometimes we need that rod. You don't like that part. His rod and his staff comforts us. How can that be? Because when we're wandering, sometimes we wander in places we shouldn't be and do things we shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And he might pull us back with the crook of that staff and then break our legs and break our hearts mm -hmm. to really impact us so we'll really know what it was that we, we needed to do mm -hmm. and we didn't. In a shepherd that takes care of sheep, there's a story that when a sheep wanders, a shepherd will go after him and break his legs. And that's what I was saying, breaking his legs. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, that sounds so cruel. But then he picks him up and he carries him under his cloak until he heals. And what does that sheep hear? The heartbeat of the shepherd. And that's a picture of what God does to us. He may break us, but it's not to destroy us. It's to make us want to know him more. Because we, we learn that the only comfort, true comfort in our lives can only come from him. So he carries us through those hard places. Through those places that we say, I can't make it. This is too much for me. I can't do this. It's just, I, I don't want to live anymore. And he says, listen to my heart. It's beating for you. It's beating to give you life. It's beating to give you strength. So when that shepherd has healed that sheep and puts him back where he needs to walk, that shepherd knows that that sheep will always follow him because he has heard the shepherd's heart. And that's what God wants for us. He wants to, us to know that we can only be satisfied by him. He satisfies our heart. There are areas in our life that only God can fulfill. He is filling every board in our life with himself. So I go back to that song and it's Fount of, I can't think of the whole name of it, but I, I love it. It says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Mm. Does it say take? No, it says, here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. 
seal it in thy courts above. And the seal that we do have is the Holy Spirit. It says it in the scripture. We have been sealed. And you know what? When you take a, a hot wax and you melt it on a little thing that would, you know, seal something, when you put it down, you put your hand down in place of it, it's going to burn. But sometimes it hurts in order to get the healing that we need. Because you have to burn out the things that need to be burnt out. The things that need to be taken out of our lives. But after that, as we're healing, there's a joy and there's a peace. And there's a comfort that only God can give to us. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, take my heart. We have to give our heart. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, I'm going to take your heart. No. He's waiting for us to give him our hearts. And it's not, I'm not just talking to people who are not saved. I'm talking about everybody. People who are saved and unsaved. Because as we walk, many of us say, we're Christians. But there are things in our lives that we need to do better. Things we need to give up. Mm. Things that we need to say, oh no, we all speak in Spanish. Y'all no mas. <laughs> But we can say that, but we need him. And when we are, when we are grounded in the word, when we have confessed him as our savior, we have everything we need in the Holy Spirit. But we need to listen to him and respond to that spirit. People who are unsaved don't have what we have. It's the blessing of knowing Jesus Christ, knowing that he was given to us as a sacrifice by our loving God. A God who knew that we needed more. Because in the old days, they would go like, oh no, we don't want to see God. Because he's just too much. But they could understand and they could, they could deal with a man who was God himself. <laughs> in flesh. How wonderful a God he is. He is so just. But he was willing to take another step to win us to him. To win us out of darkness into his light. To win us out of death into eternal light. What a wonderful God. And then to even give us, after Jesus left, a comforter, a companion, that would be with us and would help us when we weren't sure which way to go. And if we asked, he would give us, he would give us that information. Not saying yes or no, but by the Spirit giving us a peace. Because when you're not at peace, there's something wrong. But when we're walking in the peace, of God, we know it. So, I just encourage all of us, those who are not saved, those who are saved, there's so much blessings, there's so many blessings, and the blessing is just speaking well of God, speaking well of one another, speaking well of our lives, how blessed we are, speaking well of leaders, mm -hmm. praying for them, Speaking well of people who, who aren't kind to us, but praying for them. That's the blessing, because God definitely speaks well of us. And do we deserve it? No. But he says, that's my child. I have done everything possible to bring them out of darkness into light. And I see them as they will be holy, full of the goodness of God. Are we there yet? No. But we have been called to that. And every day, as we seek the Lord, we draw closer and closer to what He has called us to be. Truly sons and daughters of So the Lord. I'm going to just go ahead and uh, transition into what I'm going to talk about today. 
And I, I gave it a title. Um, I just woke up with this title called The Domino Effect. Mm. And um, for any of you all that know what that means, the domino effect simply means that uh, if you took a set of dominoes and you just lined them up, just spaced a little bit apart from the other, the minute that you push one in one direction, they all tend to fall down. Mm -hmm. It looks beautiful when you have these grand displays mm -hmm. of thousands upon thousands of dominoes that are just uh, in, uh, what is it, in, in sync with falling, you know, simultaneously. But I'm not talking about physical dominoes. What I'm talking about is the moral soul of our world. And, you know, Sugar Cookie, it, it, it took only one push. That push happened in the garden mm -hmm. with Adam and Eve. And from that one push, our morality has been toppling over ever since. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately because we're in an age now where... Our children are literally victims of our immorality. Mm. Mm. We're supposed to be the adults. We're supposed to be the ones who are mature. We're supposed to be the ones who are setting example for the next generation mm. and the generations to follow. Yet, the way that we are living as a total society does not reflect any type of moral upbringing and it definitely does not reflect God in any form or fashion. And I was thinking about it uh, in particular, this moral decay, literally my opinion, began with the decline of the male within society. Mm -hmm. You know, today, men, for the most part, are overlooked when it comes to raising families, when it comes to uh, excuse me, leadership in the community, when it comes to, you know, setting standards uh, in this world. Um, this world has gone into a direction now where men, real men, are obsolete. We have women who now, they just decide, I want to have a baby and they don't want to do it God's way through the normal channel that God has set, the best channel that God has set, which is to actually be married, mm -hmm. then enjoy one another with, uh, you know, sexual uh, desire. And then from that, create a family union. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with sex. It's just that when it's not inclusive in a marriage of one man and one woman, which is the only way God recognizes marriage, then you have something that literally, I have to just say it, it's just immoral. And I'm not saying this because this is the way Mac feels. I'm saying this because the Bible says so, and I actually have a scripture in front of me right now that really talks to this. So I've been thinking about things because, you know, quite frankly, even in our marriage, we have uh, young people who have been grafted in that we call our sons and daughters. And in some of the cases, they have been victim to not having 
a, a, a solid male presence in their lives. And it has made a difference. And I'm not saying this to, to beat them up at all. I'm saying this because it's just a sad uh, statement of events that, you know, they're not alone. That there, there are many communities that now are literally uh, raising children in every way except for the godly way. Mm -hmm. And that's not because maybe the father has died. It's just simply decisions that are made. Yeah, it's all right. I'm going to have a baby. Doesn't matter if I'm married. I don't really see marriage as anything relevant. I just want a child. I want to raise a child. And the thing is, and no shade to, to women at all, you can definitely raise a child alone. I've seen it happen. I know many people who have been raised and raised well. But there's always going to be a part that's going to cry out for the male side of that. Mm -hmm. Because it's simply impossible for a woman to be able to totally relate to what it is to be a man in the same fashion, to keep it fair. There's no way for those single fathers out there that you can truly understand raising a daughter all of it, the her, her her whole being. It's great when you have influences of the opposite sex to at least come in and to be able to be a part mm -hmm. of things just so that there is a level playing field for our children. And I've been, I thought about it in the global sense and, you know, I relate this back to Genesis 1, darling, because, well, actually, Genesis 3, uh, because the failure of a man in the garden has created everything that we are dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. It has literally been a domino effect that has gone on for centuries upon centuries. And we're just now at a further, way further along, honestly closer to what the prophets were talking about, which is like the status of how things are gonna be in the end time. And if you read end time scriptures, I'm telling you, it surely reflects a lot of what's going on right now. And it's just no way to get around that. You know, uh, some of the, the ways that we are now looking at what is hip, what is the end thing, what is dope, whatever your, your language is, are people that are parading around promoting promiscuity in their mental lives, their sexual lives, with no regards to the collateral damage that's done to those who are watching and are following because they don't know any better. You know, in my household, there were times I had to check my daughter because the skirt was just too short. And I said, there's just no way I can allow you to go out here looking like that. You know, and I just think that the parameters of how we're raising our children, how we're living in our societies, how men treat women, how women treat men, it's all askew. There, there is no consideration, it seems, of anything that is godly. And I think this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in the scriptures that I'm getting ready to read for you. So if you have your word around you or in front of you, um, let's go to Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to actually start with uh, verses 16, I believe, and 17, 
Um, and those two verses are just kind of setting up things for what I really want to share. So Romans 1 verse 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, that could preach right there. Yes. <laughs> I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Mm. This is, <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the main thing, and this is already powerful. Okay, from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. In the King James, it would say, for the just shall live by faith. Same thing. And so I just want to talk about that for a moment before I continue into the heart of this message. I'm going to let Sugar Cookie make sure that I stay within a certain parameter because <laughs> I, you know, I can just talk all day long. Um, but within this, I wanted to start off with verse 16 because there's a declaration being made that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of it. You know, I, I wear it. I wear it on my heart. I wear it on my sleeve. I wear it in my mind. And, you know, we were listening to some uh, stuff online uh, this week. In fact, I, I'll even say it because I don't even mind promoting it. We were listening to a program that is on YouTube. It's called Fearless. Uh, with Jason Whitlock. And so I'm stealing directly from this because one of the ministers who was a guest on this past Wednesday was talking about everything has flip-flopped. And he says the things that are now public should be private. And he's talking about the Twitter universe, the Instagram universe, the TikTok universe where everybody's just pouring out their entire business, things that really should not be said publicly. And now everybody's just sharing every minute detail of their lives. So that has become public. And the, then he said, and this was the, the thing that makes you say, hmm, those things that we now keep private, our faith, our beliefs, mm -hmm. those things have become private. And those are the things that should be public. We should be leading with our faith. And so I wanted to say that because this is exactly what Paul is talking about I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone, everyone who believes. So he doesn't leave anyone out. It goes on further to say to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And the Greek is just synonymous for the Gentile which is really just saying anyone who is not Jewish. That's all it's saying. And so it's available to anyone who believes. All right? And so I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Every week, every Sunday, we come out here. Um, I try to play an instrument halfway decent. Myra shares beautiful messages, so sweet, but so to the point. And then I try to share a relevant word, but the, 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 the common denominator is the fact that we are pursuing those things which are true based upon the gospel. And so it is written, the just, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, elementary school here. 
For those that don't understand faith, the biblical definition says, you know, that faith, and it says now faith, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You go further down and it simply says, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. Him being God, him being Yahweh. And so now I want to just go in and as they say um, in theology, I want to exegete some text. Is that all right, yeah. darling? Bye. Let's do it. All right. So let's drop further down. I read verses 16 and 17. And so now I'm going to go from 18 to 28 or as much as I can get through in this setting. Because now it's talking about the times that we live in today. Listen to this. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So, everything that's happening right now it's being revealed. Heaven has literally taken off the blinders so that now all of our promiscuous living is on full display and it is counted as unrighteousness in the sight of God. And it talks about people suppressing the truth. And you know how people suppress the truth? That's because they end up creating their own truth. <laughs> okay, because we hear it all the time. Oh, man, you're flowing in your truth. Oh, you know what? This is my truth, y'all. You know, and, and we, we say these things and don't recognize that these things are birthed out of Illuminati, birthed out of New Ageism, and birthed out of pagan worship that puts the onus on it's all about me. I'm the power. I'm the glory. I'm the dominion. I'm the authority. I have the, I have rulership over my body, over my thoughts, over my beliefs. We use words randomly like my aura, my karma. And we, we, we delve into these words not understanding that these are the words of satanic influence. And God wants no part of that. And if you understood it like I've understood it already, that God has literally just taken his hands off of this world. And that is why everything is so buck wild in it right now. As I said before, you take a man out of the household and that household falls like those dominoes. You take God the Father, you take God the Father out of things and we as well fall like dominoes. Let me continue on before I get too long in this. It says, because that which is known about God is evident with them, for God made it evident to them. You know what that's saying? That is literally saying that there's nothing about God that should be a surprise to anyone any longer. I know when we, when we because we are classified as missionaries, they always uh, talk about going to those places that are untapped. And honestly, what God is saying right here through Paul is that really, I've tapped all the world. I've already tapped them. And so we need to be mindful of the things that we say just because we haven't reached them with the Bible just because we haven't reached them with scripture, 
just because we had to reach them, and I'm speaking because we're in the, well, we're not in the United States, but we are of the United States, but, uh, you know, we who are from the United States, from North America, I see you, Rochelle, God bless you. Um, we have a tendency to think that we can go into any other area of the world and evangelize the world as if they don't know anything about God. <laughs> but what the scripture is literally saying here is that God is saying himself that I've made myself very much evident already. Because Paul is speaking to the church at Rome. How many years ago? Way more than I can figure out. And he's saying that it's evident. I, again, this is not my my feelings, guys. This is the word of God. Okay, so then it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made so that they are without excuse. So look at you. Do you know what that means? I'm, let me break it down for you. So God is saying, oh, maybe you haven't heard my word. Maybe you haven't been visited by a missionary or an evangelist or a preacher. But guys, the very creation that I've made exposes my divine nature. You, you can't make this up. What God is saying is that you don't have to have a Bible in front of you in order to know that he exists. And he says that it is clearly evident that I'm here and that you should know me. And I, and I think that we, we are missing out so much because we want to give people a pass because they say, oh, we've got untouched regions that we haven't touched. You're right. Human beings have not touched it, but God has already touched it with his Holy Spirit. In fact, I can even back that up in scripture because when it talks about the beginning uh, through Genesis 1, it literally says that, the spirit of the Lord was upon the face of the deep, which means that his spirit preceded anything that was made in what we now call earth. And so God has touched everything. He's evident. I don't care whether you're Mayan. I don't care whether you're Asian. I don't care whether you're European. I don't care whether you are Canadian or Nordic. It does not matter. God has touched you. He's evident. And it says it right here. Let me see if I can catch myself up. Listen to this. It says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings and their senseless hearts were darkened. And we talk about that simply saying that we all have hearts that have been darkened and each and every day we wake up praying that God would clean up a little bit more of these hearts which are despicable in and of themselves. And that's why we need God. That's why he sent the word in the form of Jesus to be our savior, to create in us a clean heart and renew within us the right spirit. <laughs> this thing is, is actually preaching itself. <laughs> Listen to this. And this is, is so much reflects society. I'm still in Romans 1. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And that's where we are today, guys. 
we have more advanced technology than has ever existed existed excuse me since time began mm -hmm. their science is simply incredible and i am not sitting here as one who in any way uh downplays the effect of science in our world we need science we need medicine we need these things because god has instituted them you know we don't have to go around uh, laying hands on people every moment that they get sick because you know what? God has allowed for medicine in some cases to take over for that. So he, he's definitely given us science as an avenue. He's given us intellect as a way of being able to understand things. However, when it comes to the things of God, honestly, I think I'd rather be a little more dumb. <laughs> and when I say that, dumb to human intellect and wise to the spirit of God. And so those that are walking around even today in our society, they walk as authorities they make uh, claims and mandates on things that we need to do in order to be a safe society. And any mention of God by anyone who truly believes in God, and that would include me and Sugar Cookie, and we are deemed to be idiots. It's out there, guys. And so claiming to be wise they became fools because the wisdom of man can never supersede the wisdom of God. In fact, you know what? It can't even supersede if there's such a thing as the stupidity of God because God is all of that and a bag of chips. Okay, so listen to this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, that would be the Holy God, the Spirit of God, they exchanged that for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. And let me just break that down. How am I doing on time, darling? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, we'll wrap it up. So look at, look at this. It starts with man becoming his or her own God. And then it branches out into the birds. There are places in this world that worship animals, those that fly, and the beasts that are on the ground, four-legged. They, they, they worship the animals. And in fact, I'll say it because I can say it. We have an organization that's out here, uh, PETA, P-E-T-A. And by golly, if you kill a roach, <laughs> that is blasphemy, but they don't have any problem with abortion. I'm just saying, this is, this is the world that we live in, that the, the creeping things of the earth, the animals, the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air have more uh, uh, authority, more relevance, more honorable uh, attributes. Therefore, God gave them up to vow impurity in the lust of their hearts. And in the um, King James says retrobate minds, I believe. Uh huh. But therefore God gave them up to vow inequity, in, uh, excuse me, vow impurity in the lust of their hearts so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Listen to this. For they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood and worshiped 
and served the creature, that would be us, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for that which is contrary to nature. If y'all don't understand that, that's homosexuality. And likewise, men too abandoned natural relations with women and burned in their desire toward one another, males with males committing shameful acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. So basically, in this world where we have LGBTQIA, our mental P, I don't know, <laughs> whatever we want to call this, that has taken over from the dynamic that God created from the beginning. And now it is actually not so or not so um, uh, permissible for men and women to get married, but it's celebrated when people come out. And is there something when that you even have to describe your your relationship as coming out of something? Because if you're coming out of something, that really means only thing that can come out is something that's been in darkness can come out and be revealed. So you're in darkness and you're coming out into the light. And so why do they call these things like we're coming out of the closet? We're, we're, you know, <laughs> I think about I'm coming out. I want the world to know. Gotta let it show. But that's never related to the gospel. It's always related to anything that is not a reflection of God. And so, you know, we wonder why we now have celebrities, and I know I'm over, and this is why we have celebrities and people of immoral repute dictating how we should live as people. Basketball players are telling us how to live. Singers who want to be referred to as they, we, <laughs> them, are telling us how to live. People who decide to have entanglements are telling us how to live. People who now say, oh man, I dreamed about harems. They're the ones that are telling us how to live. Those who are going around giving lap dances on Satan are telling us how to live. And God is not pleased at all. God is not happy at all. I see you, Sheila. God does not even acknowledge what is going on in this world and that's why he is taking his hands off of it I'm closing up listen to this verse 28 mm. and just as they did not fit to acknowledge God or excuse me and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God God gave them up to a deprived mind mm. To do those things mm. that are not proper. Mm. So when I say that God is taking his hands off this world, I'm not making that up. And, you know, the world has been given exactly what it has asked for. And so we should not be upset. We should not be discouraged because of the things that are going on in our world. 
we believe everything that's being read. One day, someone is popular. The next day, they go back, uh, society goes back 10 years in their life to when they maybe weren't as mature when they said things that go against what the flow is today and all of a sudden they are canceled or what they consider cancel culture and this is the world that we have become. Well, let me tell you, if you want to talk about true cancel culture, the real cancel culture is God canceling out the wicked. Just as they did in the days of Noah, we keep rejecting him. We keep denying the power of his very presence through nature, through creation, through the spirit. And we fall into the latest gizmo, the latest movement, the latest cause, not understanding folks that these things that we deal with, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's about BLM, whether it's about Me Too, whether it's about the recent goings on in Texas with abortion, that those are smoke screens for what the real issue is, which is spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you don't understand that the real war is the war against good and the war with evil. If you're not understanding that, then you really are not understanding anything that's going on right now. Everything else that we debate about, lose hairs over, uh, create new names for, I think about vaxxed, unvaxxed, <laughs> everything that we do is a smokescreen for this, this, uh, this warfare of the devil trying to steal the worship of God away from human beings. Oh, blessed Lord, we just thank you that you are so gracious and kind that in your wisdom and in your knowledge of humanity, you have caused us to be blessed. Because if you turned away from us, we would just self-destruct. But you have not given us on, up on us. You still love us, and you provide us for us, even as you take your hand off. We know that you are there. So there's always hope, there's always a chance. There's always an opportunity to come out of darkness into your marvelous light. So we pray every day, not only for our salvation, because we're walking through that, because we are saved, we're being saved, and we are saved. But we pray for those who are truly in darkness and believe in our heart that they will come out, that some of them will be saved until the day that Jesus Christ comes again. We, as your people, have hope for those who eventually will come and know you and have a testimony that will influence others. So what the enemy is doing, perverting, distorting and causing so much havoc God can change for good by someone in that community truly being converted and being an example and influence on someone else so God we thank you for the possibilities that are here in this present age. We are not discouraged. We are not cast down. We, your people, have hope that more will come, that more will sacrifice and suffer for your name's sake and your glory 
will be a present in this earth for those who need to repent and turn from their wicked way. Thank you, Lord. You're so, so good. You are so, so open to people who don't deserve it as we are undeserving of your love. But we thank you that nothing that is done can change your heart because you are always open to receive one who sincerely repents and turns away. What a marvelous God you are. What a wonderful Lord you are. Beautiful in every situation. You are God, and there is none other. In the name of Jesus, we praise your holy name. Amen. Amen.